Hey, what's up you guys? My name is Tyler Ruggy. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about crested geckos and how to care for them. Also, this is Valerian. He is one of our male breeder crested geckos. He's actually probably our biggest male crested gecko, which is kind of crazy. So for anyone who isn't aware, I run a business called Celestial Exotics with my partner Maddie, and we work with a lot of different species, but the one that we breed the most of currently is crested geckos. We've raised hundreds of babies. We have probably over 100 babies we're currently raising at this very moment. Don't worry, he's okay. So we just have a lot of experience with caring for crested geckos. They are, in my opinion, one of the best pet reptiles ever for literally anyone because of how simple they are to care for. Bye. What you'll notice is they definitely like to jump. Yeah, they make great pets because of how easy they are to care for, which we're gonna get into, of course. And also, despite how jumpy he's being, they are very docile and relatively easy to handle animals. Some are much more common than others. Valerian is definitely a jumper. And aside from consistently wanting to jump to their death, they aren't typically aggressive animals. They can bite. Once in a while we have geckos that do like to bite, but typically that's not the case. They just want to jump. So anyways, I'm going to put Valerian away and then we're going to get into the care of crested geckos. So before we get into the specifics, let's just go over some really cool facts about crested geckos. So their scientific name is Corolophus ciliatus, but of course most people just refer to them as crested geckos. And they're native to southern New Caledonia, which is just a chain of islands that's east of Australia. And what's really cool about crested geckos that you wouldn't think would be the case is we actually previously thought that they were extinct not that long ago. They were just rediscovered in 1994. I mean, it was a while ago, but you wouldn't expect that just in the 90s, we didn't think that these geckos existed. Now they're one of the most prominent reptiles in the pet trade. As far as how big they get, like I said, Valerian was one of our largest males. They typically get around seven to nine inches in length, so they do not get that big in the grand scheme of things, and that's including their tail. As far as their lifespan goes, they tend to live around 15 to 20 years on average, just kind of depending. And something that I just wanted to mention because I get a lot of questions about this whenever I show a gecko that doesn't have a tail, because people are like, why does that gecko not have a tail? As I'm sure a lot of you are aware, a lot of gecko species have a defense mechanism where they drop their tail as a way to escape from a predator. They typically do it whenever they're startled. So crested geckos also do this, and it can happen really at any time if they just get scared by something. And sometimes people just find them in their enclosure and they don't have a tail anymore and they don't know what happened. So it can happen really just randomly and there's nothing wrong with it happening. It doesn't hurt the gecko in any way. However, they don't regrow their tail. So once they drop their tail, that's it. They're left with a frog butt. And I also wanna mention that I have a couple crested gecko videos that I'll link in the description below where I go into detail about some specific issues people run into with their care. And I'm just not gonna go into deep detail about those things in this video. So one of them is just common mistakes people make with their crested geckos. And the other one is what to do if your crested gecko isn't eating. So yeah, those are just good videos to watch that go over some other just random things you might run into. But this video, I'm gonna try to stay on topic and just focus specifically on their care requirements. So without further ado, let's actually get into their care. The very first thing that you really need to think about, of course, is what are you going to keep your crested gecko in? So because they are arboreal geckos, they like to climb and you want to have a decent amount of height in their enclosure. There isn't necessarily anything wrong with having an enclosure with a lot of floor space, but just make sure that there's some height in there as well so that they can climb around because that's what they like to do. So the minimum enclosure size, which is considered like the standard size that most people keep their adult crested geckos in is 18 by 18 by 24 inches. If you're getting a baby or a younger juvenile, I would not recommend putting them straight into the adult enclosure. I would recommend putting them in something smaller 
and upgrading them as they grow. The reason for this is because a lot of crested geckos, if they're in too large of an enclosure, they typically just don't eat very much. I've seen this happen just so many times where people put their baby gecko in an 18 by 18 by 24 and their gecko's not eating and their gecko's not growing very much and they're like, what's wrong? And then people will recommend, you know, try downgrading it and it works nine times out of 10. So I know it seems like wrong, like you morally want to give your gecko like the biggest enclosure possible, but trust me, it's much better for the gecko to keep it in something small while it's young and make sure that it's reliably eating and growing properly so that you don't stunt its growth. And then once it's actually like an adult, you can go ahead and put it in its adult enclosure size. So this is what we go by and what we do when we're growing out our baby geckos. If our gecko is smaller than 10 grams, we keep it in a six quart tub on paper towel. Again, this may seem kind of small, but for a hatchling gecko, this is completely fine and honestly what's probably best for it. What's good about keeping it in a smaller enclosure like this, it's much easier for them to find their food and it's also much easier to just monitor them, see how they're growing. Keeping them on paper towel is very sterile. You can monitor their poops very easily. And then, like I said, once they're eating and everything's good and they're growing really well, then you can start to upgrade them. You can put artificial plants in there and vines, give it things to climb on in there of course and things to hide in. Also, if you're keeping your gecko in a tub, it's very important to make sure you have ventilation holes drilled around the sides of the tub to make sure that there's proper ventilation. You wanna make sure that the enclosure that you're keeping it in is drying out in between mistings. I'm gonna get into the specifics of humidity and temperature and whatnot, but you just wanna make sure that when you're misting it, it's not staying super humid for like days afterwards because they like to have some fluctuation and just keeping them really humid all the time isn't good. So just make sure there's ventilation holes because tubs hold a lot more humidity than regular screen top enclosures. Once your gecko is over 10 grams, I would recommend upgrading it into something that's about 12 by 12 by 18. You could get the enclosure size or you get, again, a tub that's kind of a similar dimension. And then once they've reached about 25 grams is when we'll put them in their adult enclosure. Usually by this point, they're eating reliably and they're growing and you just don't have to worry about it. Now, like I said, this is just my suggestion and how we go about doing it and what we found the most success doing. But if you're comfortable or you want to upgrade your geckos more quickly than that or keep them in something bigger, you can, you can try it. But I'm just saying if your gecko isn't eating or isn't growing very well, don't be afraid to downgrade them and keep them in something a little bit smaller because it is what's best for them to make sure that they're eating an adequate amount and growing the way they should as opposed to accidentally stunting their growth. And also, like I said, I have a video all about what to do if your gecko isn't eating, and that'll be linked down in the description below where I go more into detail. Moving on, when you're setting up your gecko's like permanent adult enclosure, here are all the things that you need to consider. The very first thing is what enclosure are you going to use? So the most common ones, like I said, are 18 by 18 by 24 enclosures. Umad and Exoterra are the two biggest brands where you can just go to any pet store and they'll probably have it and they work great. Another really great option are Zen Habitats and the smallest enclosure that Zen Habitats makes is a two foot by two foot by two foot enclosure. And that's good if you wanna give your gecko maybe something a little bit bigger than 18 by 18 by 24 when it's an adult. What's also nice about Zen Habitats is all of the sides are opaque and not see-through except for the front. Whereas like Exoterra Zumad glass enclosures, it's completely see-through on all sides and geckos tend to feel more secure when they're not being seen at all angles. Plus, if you're looking to get multiple enclosures and kind of configure them together, Zen Habitats is really great for that because they make spacers and stands for their enclosures. And they're also now coming out with black enclosures, which is great if you're not a huge fan of the wood look. Now you can get all black enclosures from them. And if you guys wanna get a Zen Habitats, my affiliate link will be down in the description below. Just wanted to give you a couple different options and Zen is really great because of course you can just get it shipped straight to your door and they're just really nice looking display enclosures. Then another extremely common thing about housing geckos that people always ask is can you cohab them? And trust me, I know how tempting it is to get multiple geckos. I'm sure you guys are aware. But I would not recommend keeping them together. If you're gonna keep multiple geckos, make sure that you're just keeping them separate. Crested geckos are not social animals. They do not benefit at all from being kept together. If anything, it just causes unnecessary stress. Some people will keep female crested geckos together with success and apparently don't have any issues with them fighting. There's still always the chance that they will fight and potentially harm each other and just cause unnecessary stress. There's really just no point in keeping them together. There's no benefit. As far as putting males together, they will 100% 
fight each other and hurt each other and potentially kill each other, so please don't do that. Male and female geckos you can put together, of course, for breeding purposes. Do not put them together if you don't want them to breed, but it's best to only introduce them once they're proper breeding size and breeding age. So typically this is two years old, 40 grams for male, 45 grams for females but it's still best to not house them together permanently. You should separate them once they're done breeding because again, keeping them together will just stress them out. No benefit to doing that. Bottom line, I would not recommend housing crested geckos together. So moving back to setting up your enclosure, once you've chosen what enclosure you're gonna get, the next thing you wanna probably think about is what substrate you're going to use. So like I said, when you're kind of growing your gecko out in a tub, I would recommend using paper towel. And you can technically keep them on paper towel their entire lives if you want to. It's definitely more work changing out the paper towels and keeping it clean. So typically once our geckos reach about 20 plus grams, we'll put them on a loose substrate. The reason we don't do this when they're young, it's much easier to monitor their poops when they're on paper towels. And definitely really small hatchling sized geckos are more at risk of impaction if they were to accidentally eat a mouthful of dirt. But that's not something that you need to worry about at all with adults. If they for some reason ate a little bit of dirt, as long as you're caring for it properly, they should have no issue at all passing it. For that reason, we typically wait till they're about 20 plus grams to put them on loose substrate. So of course, commercial substrates that you can use, and you could also mix your own substrate. If you're mixing your own, you can look up. There's a ton of different recipes and ratios of different things people mix together for substrates. Um, it's typically like maybe 80% topsoil and 20% sand. Maybe you'll mix some sphagnum moss and some orchid bark or something in there. There's like a billion different ways you can go about mixing your own substrate, so you can just look up online what other people do and find your favorite one that you want to try. If you're getting a commercial substrate, I would recommend getting something that's like soil based. I wouldn't recommend getting like orchid bark and just keeping them on bark or just keeping them on cypress mulch or keeping them on sand or keeping them on like wood shavings or anything like that. Stick to something that's like soil based and something that's going to hold humidity and have good drainage. My favorite substrate mixes are made by the BioDude. He makes different substrate mixes for different species and just different applications. So he has one called Terrafauna, which is made specifically for crested geckos and other species that are kept similarly. And this substrate mix is made to maintain proper humidity, but also allow for proper drainage for plants. What's nice about buying a pre-made mix like this is you don't have to worry about mixing things and buying different ingredients and all that stuff. It's all just there in a bag and you use it. And I also have a code RUGGY10, which you can use to get 10% off the biodude.com. So if you're gonna get anything from his website, make sure to use my code so that you can get a discount. And then as far as all the other stuff that you add to the enclosure, you wanna add branches and vines maybe cork rounds, things that your gecko can kind of climb on. Make sure to use and take advantage of all the vertical space. You can use live plants, which is what I would highly recommend, or you can use artificial plants as well. I would highly recommend setting up a bioactive enclosure because it's very naturalistic. And in my opinion, in the long run, it's a lot less maintenance than just a regular setup. It's definitely a little bit more expensive and more work to start up at first, but once you have it all set up, in the long run, you don't have to like do big substrate changes. Like if you don't have a bioactive, you know, you'd have to spot clean, pick up poops, and every once in a while throw away all the substrate and replace it. With a bioactive, you really don't have to worry about doing that because all of the microfauna in there, the isopods, springtails, and everything, just kind of take care of that for you. Again, want to shout out the bio dude because he has bioactive kits on his website that are, again, made for specific species where he puts kind of everything you need in a kit so it'll come with live plants, branches, and you can go buy whatever enclosure size you have and it'll just have everything you need in it, lighting for the plants. So again, all of that link down below as well. Of course, you can also buy everything separately if you wanna choose out the specific plants and whatnot that you want to use. But when you're setting it up, of course, just make sure that you're taking advantage of all of the space in the enclosure, having branches and vines going across, just using all of the vertical space and then having foliage so the geckos can hide in it. So moving on to heating and lighting. One of the best things about crested geckos, in my opinion, is that they do really great at like average room temperatures. So anything in the range of about 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit is what I would consider an optimal ambient temperature for them. At nighttime, it's okay for their temperature to drop down to the mid 60s, but I wouldn't let it go much lower than 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And then if their enclosure goes above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, that can be fatal to them because they are sensitive to heat. 
And you want to be especially careful with baby geckos because they're much more prone to dehydration and overheating. And the reason I say 69 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit is the optimal range, but I kind of insinuated it can go up to 85 before it becomes fatal, I would try to avoid letting the enclosure get close to 85 because it's very easy for it to go over that by accident. But if you have lighting on the enclosure like UVB or LEDs, it's going to heat up the top of the enclosure a little bit. If you're monitoring the ambient temperature of the enclosure and you notice that the very top close to the lights is like 85 degrees, then you shouldn't freak out as long as the bottom of the enclosure, kind of in the shade farther away from the lights, is lower than that. So if the bottom of the enclosure is, let's say, 75 degrees, but the very top of the enclosure is 85, that's okay because the gecko can still go to the bottom and cool down. You should just be concerned, basically, if the entire enclosure is really hot and the gecko can't escape the heat. This is typically an issue if just the entire room that the gecko is being kept in ends up overheating and getting above 85, but that's why it's important to monitor the temperature gradient in the enclosure so you can make sure that your gecko has a cooler space to escape to if the top of the enclosure gets a little bit warm. So I would recommend getting a digital probe thermometer slash hygrometer. These are much more accurate than the analog ones and it's nice because it'll tell you the temperature and the humidity and you can place the probe anywhere in the enclosure and it'll tell you the temperature and the humidity in the enclosure. I would also recommend getting an infrared temp gun so that you can literally gun different areas of the enclosure. You can gun right where the lights are shining down and see what the temperature is. You can gun down by where the dirt is and see how cool it is and just see the different temperature range anywhere in the enclosure really easily. And like I said, I'll have these products linked below. Any Amazon links are going to be affiliate links. So if you're gonna buy any products on Amazon, please use my affiliate links. That would be really cool. Yeah, bottom line as far as heating goes, because they have such a mild temperature range and do really well at room temperature, an external heat source should not be necessary. You shouldn't have to put a heat lamp or anything on top. Like I said, if you're using UVB or LEDs, these will emit a little bit of heat and naturally create a warmer spot at the top of the enclosure anyway. So this will give them a temperature gradient and give them the opportunity to thermoregulate by moving closer to the lights or farther away. Using an actual heat lamp isn't necessarily necessary. And I can actually show you guys what I mean by using one of our enclosures as an example where we have LEDs and a UVB on there. We have no heat lamp on there, but towards the top of the enclosure close to the lights, it's warmer. And then as you move to the bottom of the enclosure, it gets much cooler. So if you want to give your gecko a thermal gradient like that, that can be achieved without a heat lamp. But let's say your enclosure, just for whatever reason, maybe your house is freezing cold and it's like 60 degrees all the time, then maybe you would want to add a heat source. And in that case, I would add something that's very low wattage and make sure you're putting it on a thermostat to make sure that it does not overheat at all. Because once you start getting over 85 degrees, like I said, that can be really bad. And it's not that hard to do that with a heat bulb, which is why I try to stray away from them as much as possible. And like I said, at nighttime, the temperatures can drop to like 65 degrees. You just don't want it to be that cold all day long. If it drops at night when the lights are turned off, that's okay. If for whatever reason, the nighttime temperature drops significantly below that and you're worried that it's too cold at night, you can add an external heat source at nighttime as long as it's one that does not emit light because that will disturb their light cycle. So something like a ceramic heat emitter or a deep heat projector. Again, you wanna make sure you're using something that's very low wattage, really just try to avoid overheating the enclosure. What's also important to remember is at nighttime, you do not need to heat the enclosure up to its daytime temperature. So if you do need to add a heat source, your goal should be to only heat it up to maybe around between 65 and 70 degrees. Past that really isn't necessary at nighttime because it's natural for the temperature to drop at night. So just something really low wattage, again, put it on a dimmer or put it on a thermostat to be extra careful. And just make sure you're monitoring the temperature really closely. I would even recommend setting up the enclosure with the heat source without the gecko even in there at first and monitoring the temperature over a few days and just make sure you have a good setup that's not going to overheat just to make sure before you actually put the gecko in there. But again, if you're just heating it up at nighttime, make sure you're using a heat source that doesn't emit light. Do not use a red heat bulb or a blue heat bulb, anything like that, because they can still see the light and it will still disrupt their light cycle. And let's elaborate on the light cycles. Basically, the sun going up and the sun going down. That way the gecko knows when it's daytime and when it's nighttime, and you can achieve this 
just by having a light source in the room. This could be literally a window in the room that gets some natural sunlight and illuminates the room the enclosure is in. That's completely fine. Make sure the enclosure is not getting direct sunlight though because that, again, could overheat it very easily. But if the room is just naturally illuminated by the daylight, that's enough to give them a natural day and night cycle. The bottom line is you do not want to put them just in a dark room that's not receiving any light. And if you are, you want to make sure that they have a full spectrum LED on their enclosure so that they still have a day and a night cycle. Make sure it's on a timer to kind of replicate when the sun goes up and when the sun goes down. And even if your enclosure is in a room that does get natural daylight. If you're keeping live plants in there, you're still gonna wanna have a full spectrum grow light LED on there to help keep the plants alive because the plants will need a good light source. So as far as an LED light that I would highly recommend, the BioDude makes one that's really great. It's called the Glow and Grow Bulbs. It'll really help illuminate the enclosure really nicely. Also, plants just tend to flourish under that LED bulb, so I would highly recommend it. You can also get grow lights on Amazon. A lot of them tend to come in packs of like multiple strips of LEDs. This is a really great option if you're setting up multiple enclosures and you want a more cost-effective way to get a bunch of lights in a kit and they can kind of connect together and it's really convenient. But I will say these lights aren't as nice as the BioDude ones. They don't illuminate the enclosure in the same way, but I do use them for some enclosures and they still work and they keep the plants alive. So if that's your goal, they get the job done. But if you're only setting up like one enclosure, I would definitely recommend investing in the nicer single LED bulb because it makes a huge difference as far as like plant growth and the way it illuminates the enclosure. As far as UVB goes, should you give your crested gecko UVB? The bottom line is a lot of people keep crested geckos without UVB and don't have any issues. Like their gecko isn't going to die or become very sick from not having UVB. However, there is a lot of research that supports the fact that providing UVB even to reptiles that don't necessarily need it is definitely still very beneficial for them and just creates a much more natural environment for them. And so basically bottom line is I would recommend giving them UVB because they will get UVB exposure in the wild. UVB lights also provide them with UVA, which is a spectrum of lighting that we can't see, but reptiles can see and it affects the way they view their surroundings. So giving them the UVB bulb will also help them just see things better. And although they aren't animals that'll necessarily come out and bask all day like a bearded dragon, they're still going to get UVB exposure in the wild, even if it's under shade or even if they just have like a leg that's sticking out and getting some natural sunlight. So it's best to also allow them to have that exposure in captivity. But it is important that you give them the proper UVB bulb. You can't just slap anyone on there because you can overdo it. So you wanna make sure you're getting a bulb that puts out the right amount for whatever species you're keeping. And in this case, I would highly recommend the Arcadia Shade Dweller Bulb. It's a bulb that's made specifically for reptiles that typically dwell in the shade, as the name suggests. Also, I do sell it on my website, celestialexotics.net. So my website will be linked down below if you would like to buy one of those. I'm not just saying this because I sell it on my website. Arcadia is definitely known to be one of the best makers of UVB bulbs, and the Shade Dweller bulb specifically is extremely popular to use for reptiles like crested geckos. Like, I would highly recommend it whether you choose to buy it from my website or not. You can buy it literally anywhere, but that is the best bulb in my opinion. And you do need to remember to change the bulb. If you read the packaging of the UVB bulb, it'll tell you how often you should change it. So that's the whole lighting spiel, the whole lighting and temperature thing. I hope that made sense. I feel like I just blabbered. As far as humidity goes for crested geckos, if I had to give you an average of about the range their humidity should be kept in, I would say around 50 to 80 percent humidity. However, I would not stress about keeping them in that exact range. There should be a lot of fluctuation and the reality is crested geckos do great if you're giving them a temperature spike and then letting the enclosure dry out mostly before you go ahead and mist it again. So as long as it's fluctuating like that, you should be good. You don't want it to be dry all the time. You don't want it to be super wet all the time. It's good to just have fluctuation. So basically what we do is do a nice heavy misting at nighttime in our enclosures, which will bump the humidity up to like 90%. And then throughout the night and into the next day, the enclosure will slowly start to dry out. The humidity will dip and it might go back down to around 40 or 50%. 
at the end of that day, we'll go ahead and mist it again. You just wanna make sure that the enclosure is drying out in between mistings. So if you go to mist the enclosure and there's still water droplets and it's like sopping wet in there, don't mist it again. <laughs> yeah, as long as you're making sure the enclosure isn't staying really humid all the time or really dry all the time and that it's just fluctuating. And this is why, like I said before, having adequate ventilation in the enclosure is really important, especially if you're keeping the gecko in a tub at any point because tubs hold a lot more humidity than a screen top enclosure will. So with our tub, we don't mist them super heavily because they hold in so much humidity. We do just kind of like a light misting that's going to make the paper towel a little bit moist and then lightly mist the sides of the tub so the gecko has droplets it can drink from. And then when you go to mist the next day, you just want to make sure that it's dried out a bit. And if you still see droplets everywhere, you don't want to mist it again. And if you notice it's taking a really long time to dry out, you might want to just add more ventilation holes. And also just a little side note, like I said, the geckos are going to get a lot of their hydration from you misting the enclosure because they like to drink droplets off of the leaves and the glass. And they also get a lot of their hydration from their food as well. So for this reason, you don't necessarily have to add a water dish to the enclosure. You can still add a water dish if you want to, it's just not completely necessary. We're getting, we're getting there, I promise. <laughs> There's a lot to go over. So. Diet for crested geckos. This is probably like the most simple aspect of their care. Thank God you don't have to listen to me ramble about this for 45 minutes, although I probably could. Their diet is also one of the things that I think makes them one of the easiest reptiles to care for because it's so simple. All you have to feed them mostly is a prepared gecko diet that comes in a bag. It's a powder. You mix it with some water until it's a nice kind of thick consistency, maybe like honey. You put a little cup of it in their enclosure and they eat it and that's what they eat. The, the powder diet has pretty much everything they need in it. You can put the cup on a ledge, which a lot of people like to do. You can also just put the cup on the ground. Some people will say that you shouldn't put the cup on the ground because it's not natural for them to eat on the ground. And that's actually not necessarily true because one of the things that they eat in the wild is fruit that has fallen off of the trees and is on the ground raw. So it's definitely not unnatural for them to eat on the ground. As far as what specific diet to feed your gecko, you just want to make sure it's a diet made specifically for crested geckos. There's Pangea gecko mix, Ligardi, Rapashi, all of which we sell on our website, celestialexotics.net. There's a ton of different flavors. What I want to make very clear is you should not try making your own crested gecko diet because there's no way to make sure it's actually properly nutritionally balanced for them. So you might be asking yourself, what do geckos actually eat in the wild? So they eat a huge variety of things, things like insects, small invertebrates, bee pollen, soft seeds, rotting fruits, like I said. So they feed on just a huge variety of things. Just stick to the commercial diets and you will have nothing to worry about. We'll typically leave their food in there for about two days before we go ahead and replace it. And I also wanna note that you do not have to get a big cup and fill it up with a bunch of food because they're not going to eat that much. We sell these little gecko cups on our website and I know it just sounds like I'm trying to push every little thing that we sell, but I am telling you, like these work extremely well. They're silicone, they're reusable. They're just these small cups especially great for things like hatchlings and small juvenile geckos because you do not need to give them a big cup of food. For hatchlings, we don't even fill up our little cups all the way. We just put like a little dab in there. For adult geckos, you could probably fill the cup up all the way and they might eat it all. You might want to give them a cup that's a little bigger than that when they're an adult, just depending how much your adult eats on the daily. I just see people all the time get those like big cups and fill them up like all the way for their single gecko. They're not going to eat all of that. So I would, I would try to just figure out how much your gecko is going to eat and actually just give them that amount. Like if the cup is mostly empty after a couple days, then that's probably a good amount to feed them. Just trying to save you guys some money, but feel free to also give them an entire cup of food every time you feed them if you really desire. Just make sure that when you're buying a new bag of food, like every two weeks that you are buying it from celestialexotics.net. So in addition to their prepared diet, I said that makes up mostly what you're gonna feed them. And I say mostly because I would also recommend offering them live insects as well. So a lot of the prepared gecko diets do have insects added in them, but it is also very beneficial to feed your geckos live insects as well because it just helps add some diversity to their diet, a little bit extra protein, 
And it's also just really good enrichment for them to be able to actually hunt and display those natural instincts of hunting down insects. And we will also dust the live insects that we feed them. We typically use Rapashi Calcium Plus. We also rotate between the different Arcadia supplements. We do find that some geckos don't eat live insects. And if you have a gecko that doesn't eat live insects, again, you do not have to worry. Just make sure you're feeding them one of the prepared diets that has insects included in it. When geckos are hatchlings, we find that they sometimes don't eat insects right away, but once they've grown a little bit and reach around three grams, they'll usually start to eat insects. And then it's also not uncommon for geckos once they become close to adulthood, they'll just randomly decide they don't like insects anymore and they'll stop eating them. You don't have to be concerned about it being bad for them as long as you're feeding them one of the diets that has insects included in it. We do find that most of our geckos just prefer to eat crickets, I think because we can just shake them in there and the crickets run around like crazy. I think that movement just helps trigger their hunting instinct. There's some geckos that will eat off of tongs and those ones we will try to feed like dubia roaches and superworms and stuff. And some of them we can do that. But for the most part, most of them prefer crickets. And you also wanna make sure when you're feeding insects, especially to smaller geckos, that you're not feeding them something that's too big because they can choke on it, of course. So a good rule of thumb to go by just to stay on the safe side is to not feed it anything bigger than the size between its eyes. And then just one more important thing to note about feeding them live insects is it is important to gut load the insects Insects. So gut loading is basically feeding the insects something that's healthy and nutritional so that when your pet is eating the insects, they are also getting something healthy and nutritional. If you're like starving the insects or not feeding them anything good, they're not going to like be very nutritionally dense for your geckos to eat. And you can look up different gut loading recipes. There's a ton of them online. It's usually gonna be made up of fresh vegetables and greens, things like that. We often use the Rapashi Super Load, which again, we saw on our website, just saying, but we actually have always used it. It's really nice because it's again, like a powder that you mix with warm water and it creates a gel sort of thing. And it's just fortified with all this stuff that's really good for gut loading. So we offer our insects that in addition to like freshly made greens and vegetables. And with that being said, I think that's everything. <laughs> I, I've been filming this for like an hour. Only I could spend an hour talking about Crested Gecko Care and hopefully I can condense this to something much shorter than that because nobody wants to listen to me talk about crested geckos for an hour. They are truly one of the easiest reptiles to care for. I just try my best to explain everything in great detail, so if you are new to keeping reptiles and you have questions about things, I try to give you all the details you need to set you up for success. So hopefully I've done a good job of that and I didn't just like overcomplicate it. They're simple little creatures, they have such floppy heads, What's not to love, you know what I'm saying? If you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I will definitely try to answer anything that I didn't cover in this video. Thank you guys for watching. If you guys found this video to be helpful, give it a thumbs up. And if you guys are new here, make sure to hit the subscribe button, of course. And I will see you guys in my next video.